What's up, everybody? We are jumping into a very, very highly requested video and always one of my favorites. The jurors speak out after Chad Daybell's trial where they came to a guilty verdict and decided to sentence him to death. And we're not going to hear from one juror this time. We're not going to hear from two. We're not going to hear from three, but six jurors are interviewed at the same time. Hopefully we're going to learn a lot about what they think, what they saw, what the strongest evidence was, what the worst of the defense was, what the best of the defense was, and how they ultimately came to their conclusion, what being sequestered was like, and so much more in this interview. I'm also going to answer your questions in the comments, and we're going to talk about whether or not you want us to look at some other juror interviews that have come out, maybe individually with some of these jurors, which you can let me know in the comments if you want additional videos reacting to and breaking those down. But for now, we're going to take a look and see what six of these jurors thought and felt throughout this wild trial. So I had never seen, or uh, I don't really know everything about these jurors beforehand or which ones they are, but just by looking at them, you can obviously see right off the bat different ages and genders. Now, you don't see any different racial backgrounds, obviously, to the eye, right? We don't know what their actual racial makeup is. You know, it could be different. But if we're talking about a cross-section of the community in the area, for those of you guys that are around that area or live in that area in Idaho, is this representative? Is this a jury of Chad Daybell's peers? I would argue, sure looks like it from this point of view. And this is kind of what a jury is supposed to look like. Um, as long as racially the makeup is similar to whatever it is in Idaho, because different ages and different genders are always important. Diverse backgrounds are really important because you don't want people to just be dug in, see things one way. You want different opinions and different ways to look at the same evidence to make sure we get the right answer, especially when we have to have unanimity in a case like this. And we're going to listen to see if they talk about how hard it was to be unanimous, how easy it was. In my opinion, when we look at this case and we compare it to I don't know, maybe even Koberger, which is going to be in the same area, which will be interesting. If we compare it to Karen Reed, to Kyle Rittenhouse, to Johnny Depp, whatever it may be, this case to me was, it's, it's always hard to, you know, come to a guilty verdict to be unanimous, especially the death penalty. That's kind of a side. We'll put the death penalty part of this aside, but this case was kind of easy. I think this was kind of easy to come to a guilty verdict. There was so much evidence. The story fit together so perfectly. It's kind of how we felt throughout the trial. We were pointing how all this stuff just couldn't be a coincidence. Uh, midway through the trial, we kept an open mind. We waited to see the defense's case in chief. And really the state just built too good and strong of a case, getting rid of all reasonable doubt. So usually when it's a, you know, easy verdict, I'll say, cause it's never easy. It's never easy to come to a guilty verdict. It's never easy to put someone else's life on the line. But when the evidence points so clearly to one direction, usually there's good camaraderie in the jury. But we've seen in other cases, you know, especially YNW Melly, where they end up with a hung jury. They didn't seem to like each other as much, at least all of them, right? There was some anonymity there or animosity, I should say there and anonymity. Um, and so, so usually that's different when it's kind of a quicker verdict for how long the case was like this case. And they kind of made the decision that it seemed like all the evidence pointed to, even in our chat, it was 95 plus percent felt like this was going to be a guilty verdict, which I think is important because that is representative of juries. I say that all the time and I'm not blowing smoke. I'm not just buttering you guys up. This chat is representative of juries across the world because we have so many diverse backgrounds and peoples and voices. That's why I like disagreement. That's why I like discussing stuff in the chat. And we're going to see there are a lot of points we made in the chat that these jurors agreed with 100%. So let's get to this interview. And we'll start here with your names. Lori. Tracy. Dana. Roy. Steve. Nick. So obviously yeah. they were cool with giving their names, which is cool with us. All right. So, uh, and your juror numbers. 18. 11. 12. Five, ten, nine. You never, you'll never forget. I'm sure. Nope. There were many more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh wow. <laughs> so let's start with uh, your overall thoughts today, Lori. You just want to start? Just we'll go around the circle. Just, just trying to soak, soak it in. It's kind of surreal. I don't even know how to describe it. It's insane that we just went through this. Two and a half months of our lives, just every day learning more and more and seeing more and more things. I think you forget about the whole picture until you get a chance to look back and go, mm -hmm. you can't write this stuff. I mean, you really can't. And, and I think I lost track of it when you're in the middle of it, of how big and how crazy this whole thing was and how many people it affected. I feel a lot the same way as the impact that it's had on so many people. And now there's 18 more of us that 
we didn't ask to do it. It was our civil duty. We did it. Mm -hmm. And now it will forever affect each and every one of us for the rest of our life. We have to live with that decision. And our families. And our families. Yeah. And I think that's a huge impact on every single one of us. It really, it really hit me hard to be on this stuff firsthand to realize just how vile mankind is. It's, it's scary. It really is. It just it's unheard of. I mean, they're talking about how it all affects them individually, and they are part of this case now. It's wild. These random people that don't know any, they, they can't know any of these people from Adam, right? They can't be involved. They can't have already been affected by the case. And what do they do? They get wrapped in, and they're as involved in this case, it seems like, as almost anybody. It's all these witnesses, the victims, the defendants, the media. They are a central part of this story now and will be forever. I mean, it's it's really interesting to hear the psyche of what it's like to be part of such a high profile jury like this. And I love that we get to interact with them, that Nate Eaton and East Idaho News gets access to these jurors. I mean, right away, this is almost immediate that it happens, which is interesting timing always. But I think they do a great job of just asking open-ended questions to see what does this jury think? What does this jury feel? I don't feel like he pushes them in any direction ever, which is what exactly what he's supposed to do and what helps us learn the most. When you get the jury summons, you think you're going to show up, you're going to jaywalk in case or something like that, and then this hits you, it, it takes you by surprise. But the thing that I hadn't factored in is, you know, we talk about the victims, the law enforcement, the prosecution, everybody that's involved, and now, of course, us. But there's also the people behind us that are now affected by this family, friends, coworkers. I went into the office today, and all of them, you know, reintroduce yourself, if you will. But all of that support structure that is also affected, maybe you know, nowhere near as much as us, again, the people investigating it, but they're, they're involved as well. And I wasn't necessarily expecting that or ready for that right. realization. Yeah, you know, they, they drop us in there into the court and into the whole system and we're there for two months and it's our lives for that time and then we're yanked out and here we are now and like i, I know i'm i still feel very connected to it and I've, I've been researching it in my some of my free time since then and yeah like what do we do now yeah yeah did any of you that's go interesting home? and it's very common that they go back and look into the details after find out what they didn't know maybe fill some gaps ask some questions that they may have had while they were on the jury i also now some people don't like to hear that i like to hear that because you want to know what that tells me about this guy if he immediately went home and started Googling this stuff, probably means he wasn't Googling it during the trial, which is exactly what he's supposed to do, not do any research. And if you don't do any research for two months and you're dying to, it's probably one of the first things you do, especially someone of his age who grew up in the internet era. I mean, that, that is an indication to me that he followed the rules of the court. Not to say the other ones didn't, but I'm just saying I, I like to hear that from somebody like him. Like Nick, and start Googling everything you can find about the case. Did. Yes. Did some of you completely say, I don't ever want to hear about See, it? Some of them, um, more than just Nick did. Yeah. I went to sleep at 7.30 <laughs> that night, and I, and I literally did not wake up out of my bedroom until 7.30 the next night. I was emotionally, physically, everything drained. And I personally turned my phone off. I didn't want to talk to anybody. Didn't want to talk about it. And then I and I got up, and then today's been a little bit different. You know, I've talked to my mother and my son, my daughter a little bit, but I didn't want to talk to anybody for a couple of days. I just wanted to digest what we had just gone through. And I didn't even you know, crossed my mind to Google it over the weekend. That's the last thing I wanted to deal with. So I didn't, I don't even know if I touched my phone, TV hadn't been on. It just wasn't even a concern of mine to, you know, learn more because probably learned more than I ever really wanted to. But that time will come. I'm not there yet though. Yeah. And there's so much more you didn't hear. <laughs> I can only imagine. I, mean, I can only imagine. So much that that, as an observer and a reporter, I'm thinking, why didn't they bring this in or that in for this in? But obviously there was enough to get a conviction. Was there, there was enough. So Nate Eaton saying, he was thinking more should have gone in. That didn't. And did any of them have questions about, was there more? Was there anything they missed? The initial response seemed to be, oh, there was plenty of evidence. Yeah. yeah. Was there a moment where you said guilty or a witness? One of the texts when it said, um, it's time, I have a plan for the children to go or to get rid of the children, however it was worded. When they had that, and they'd already built up, of course, all of the, Alex was here at this time out, you know, and, and they talked to each other 10 times before that happened. And it was like, yeah. Or, or what about so you might as well write these down and check them off because these are exactly what we said now they never said i'm going to get rid of the children they never said it that specifically but it was clear that from this jury's mind the way the prosecutors read the heart of the message or the spirit of the messages and what the theme was in the context of all these messages that the juries picked up exactly what the prosecutors put down and that's what i say in these cases that's so important is whatever it is defense prosecution plaintiff in a civil case or defense in a civil case if the jury's with you they start listening to things and looking at things exactly the way you look at them and you explain them as a lawyer. So it's important to remember that and get jurors on your side and bring them with you through this journey. And these jurors seemingly were with the prosecution. As soon as they laid the background and started to believe the prosecution was credible and these witnesses were credible, then boom, 
they start reading the text messages and the James and Elena story, exactly how the prosecutors read them. The, um, I'm grieving, but not for the reason why exactly everybody thinks. Why Again, indication that there, there's something more. They're hiding something. Check it off. Exactly what we talked about when we heard that. When he's texting Lori wife, the day after his wife. That solidified it for Lori, but I think when he starts saying, I'm going to turn up the pain and turn down the tolerance, four and then start talking about, is there a plan for the children? Do we have a perfectly orchestrated plan for the children? Right there. That did it. Again, perfectly orchestrated plan. What is that plan? To get rid of all the people that are in your way and then turning up the pain. Now, Again, if this was just a coincidence and somebody passes after you said you turned up the pain on them, you know, whatever it is spiritually, that's unlucky, but I don't think a lot of luck had to do with it. I think this was part of the perfectly orchestrated plan. They put all that stuff together, they analyzed it, and they came to the same conclusion that the chat came through, came to that this is exactly what Chad and Lori orchestrated. That eliminate the celestial obstacles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. How about you, gentlemen? One of the things that was telling and still is to me is how all of Lori's family were dark and all the Chad's outside of Tammy were light. That's when I kind of went, you know what, this is the mastermind behind this, at least in my opinion. <laughs> he, he's eliminating things that aren't close to him. They're getting in the way of what he wants. And, and that was one of the turning points for me. And that's exactly what you guys said. You pointed that out. And everybody on Lori's side is dark, but all the people that are still willing to testify for Chad are still light. So as long as he brainwashes you and manipulates you, you can stay light and you can stay alive. But if you get in his way, he's going to turn you dark and you're going to end up dead, literally. And that's exactly what the, pro the story the prosecution told. And I think that's the story the evidence told. Yeah, none of his agree. children. He had his children where he needed them. They were, they were going to back him 100%. And the one statement where he said he will be unencumbered. He had his children right where he needed them. He is. They were going to back him 100%. No doubt these people believe Chad Daybell manipulated his children. And his children were going to say whatever they needed to to protect their dad. Just really interesting. Is that the word you used? Yeah. Unencumbered? Mm -hmm. Basically free of everything that could be an obstacle to us. Yeah. I just can't fathom on my mind, though. I still can't get it. Is How can two people, three with Alex, if he were still alive, go through all this, do all this, bury them on your own property, and feel like you'll never get caught? That's what I understand. Yeah. And that they never did anything wrong. No. Like, there's no remorse. That's there. what you call an ego, though, to think mm -hmm. that you can bury these children on your property and will never get caught. Narcissist. What was the last question on so many of Lindsey Blake's crosses and redirects? And so there's these uh, counsel said there was no connection. Where were the bodies found? Where were the bodies buried? Where was Alex Cox's phone? Where did they do the search? Where was Chad Daybell when they did the search? And the answer was always Chad Daybell's property, Chad Daybell's backyard on Daybell's property. Daybell was looking back where the bodies were buried. Daybell was in the vicinity. Daybell's tools. Alex Cox was in the vicinity. I know they didn't have the, the Daybell phone records, but she continued to point out the fact that we can't get over the fact that they were buried on his yard in his yard. And to say that there's no connection, to say he didn't know, especially after his perfectly orchestrated plan, he was just getting lucky, calling everything right, calling people dark who end up passing. Like, come on. So, yeah, <laughs> narcissists from the beginning. But they didn't believe that what they were doing was wrong because they believed in one of their past worlds, their past lives, that they had repented and were forgiven for anything forever and ever and all their yep. future lives. Like it was a gimme, like doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Lori would say it doesn't count for me. Doesn't count yeah. for me, which yeah. Chad told her it didn't. Did you all get curious about Lori's sentence? Because you really or did you know that she was serving? No, that's prison? what I looked up. No, I didn't and I didn't know it was the same judge. So, same judge, so same watching court, him right? give no. the sentence for Lori's on Sunday when I watched that. Some of the things he said to us right after the trial was over, I mean, it made it mean so much more. Yeah. I, I hadn't watched it yet. Find out that you did it right, right? You get thrown into this. You have no clue what you're doing as a juror. You do your best. You listen to the instructions. You come up with a sentence. And then you go and you hear what an expert, what a judge says at sentencing. And you feel like you got it right, right? You look at what the other jury did. They convicted Lori Vallow. Uh, Boyce gave her life. Just, you know, the most he gave her, really all he could give her because there was no death penalty. But you listen to his comments. And you got to feel pretty good. Like for your first time, you did it right. This very experienced, you know, expert judge, expert legal person, as most judges are seen to be, did the same thing as you and basically felt the same way about the case that you did. But I still haven't watched it, but it's, I'll have to go back and watch that. But And the fact yeah. that he didn't say anything, that he had the chance to say something, even to defend himself, to have some sort of remorse to, even if it was to say, I didn't do this, that really is like, well, that's the final straw. I mean, no. so again, that's one thing we hate to hear. Um, we get it. And I think she's just being honest. And I think most jurors would say, I would have liked to hear from Chad Daybell, 
The fact that he didn't testify was the final straw for her. My guess is if she were to really think back, it was already done before he said he didn't testify and him saying he didn't do it probably wouldn't have changed anything, especially if she thinks, or these, this juror thinks jury thinks that he brainwashed his kids. Obviously he's going to get up there and say whatever he needs to, to save his own butt. He was speaking through his lawyer basically. <clears throat> so we can imagine what he would have said, but you know, we never want the defendant's silence held against him. It was a little bit different in this case. Cause there was, you know, no mitigation during the penalty phase. And they start to mention that a little bit. I think here I've, I've seen clips of it, by the way. Um, so I know some of what's coming. Um, so they do talk about that. And there's a little mix there of, you know, remorse and saying sorry and stuff in the penalty phase versus testifying in the guilt phase. But we always hate to see the defendant's silence held against him because that's all of our rights to remain silent. Um, and that's a very important constitutional right that we have to protect and we can't hold against criminal defendants if we are on jurors, on juries. No, there's nothing. no there's allocution, no, no mitigating factors. No mitigating factors. You know, he wouldn't even try to. Defend it makes himself. me wonder if he almost wanted he said in the back of the, the cruiser, I'm going, I'm not coming back. I'm not coming and that, back. One of those. There's another checkbox that when we heard that, we knew, oh, for a jury to hear, he knows he's not coming back. Is that not consciousness of guilt? And I don't even know if they had found the bodies yet. And if he didn't know they were on his yard, why does he know he's never coming back? That's not a connection to Chad Daybell. And he was really set up unknowingly. Why would he say that? And guess what? It was important. To I mean, we're seven minutes in. And they have lined up and knocked down so many points you guys made in the chat as we walked through this trial together and said, what was important? What were the big factors? As witnesses and testimony and evidence was coming out, we were like, that's bad for them. That's bad for them. They're proving this case. They're proving it beyond a reasonable doubt. Let's wait to see what the defense says. And it looks like they did the same thing. That, you yeah. know, it's like, why would he say that if he didn't think he did this? So that was always in the back of my mind as well. And why would, why would somebody, him, his attorney, whatever, not give us enough mitigating factors to state that he should get life in prison and not the death penalty right the best the or his closing arguments were they were after chad he was a victim and so people have been sending me a couple different videos and articles about why they wouldn't have done this is it potentially because they're setting up an appellate issue that um his defense did not have time to prepare for the death penalty phase and maybe they'll be able to appeal that on the penalty side i don't think it's going to help him on the guilt side it may help him on the penalty side only having one lawyer you know we talked about it throughout the whole trial uh, prior was doing this by himself. Maybe he's setting that up when he did a motion to withdraw. He said he didn't have enough resources and time to prepare this appropriately. The judge did not appoint, um, co-counsel. He didn't continue the case, but he had a bunch of continuances and he used that as a reason for multiple continuances. And I believe Boyce put on the record when they said they weren't going to do mitigation and allocution, even ask Chad Daybell, you had time to prepare. Your lawyer had witnesses, your lawyer had evidence, but you're going to waive your right and not put that stuff on. I'm just going off memory, but I believe that they said something like that on the record um, before Chad Daybell waived his right to present that evidence during the penalty phase. So it may be a shot at an appeal. I'm not sure how good of a shot it is. Right now it's after life insurance money from Chad, except for the 9th of October and the 19th of October in the two instances when there was threat on Tammy's life and then took her life. If it were Chad, Tammy would be the insurance, you know, the beneficiary. Not I mean, that's something you guys picked up on and that we discussed because we have the benefit of watching it back and reacting and recapping. They picked it up in real time. That prior was trying to make the, the argument that Lori wanted Chad dead because she wanted Chad's insurance money. It's like she wanted to get her greedy hands on Chad and Chad's insurance money is what, what he said. That's false. That is not, that would not have happened. And they looked at it. They discussed so I don't know. I'm not saying prior thought this trial, this jury was full of dummies or anything like that. We've heard clients and lawyers basically called jurors idiots or people at a bus stop or whatever it may be. Oh, this jury was paying attention and they picked up that that argument was not correct. It was absolutely a false argument. And we've said this from the jump. Once you start to lose credibility with the jury as a criminal defense attorney, it is so hard to get it back. Once they figure out one of the things you're throwing against the wall is total BS, it's a lot harder to get any of the other BS to stick. So credibility is so important for lawyers. What we say is not evidence, but our credibility is key in representing and defending our clients or prosecuting cases. So if that's the best thing you have to try to give us reasonable doubt, that, that was, the, the that was bad. said about Judge, yeah. Judge Chad on his past, not yeah. on now, not on the current. Mm -hmm. But he didn't give anything. He didn't give us anything. Did anything from the defense stick or make you think, hmm, that's a good point? Ironically for me, the one thing from all the defense witnesses that factored into my 
you know, opinion and decision was his um, forensic analysis, whatever you call them, who said that was the first time I at least heard that Tylee had, you know, fractured skull and jawbone. And that didn't work in his favor. That is really the only thing from that I drew from them that contradicted anything else. I hadn't heard that before. I think they heard hurt his case worse. I think they hurt his case. Yeah. Oh yeah, his witnesses definitely. Hurt the witness, his case. even of, even the uh, one who questioned the asphyxiation. Oh, absolutely, yeah. because she didn't have all the. I mean, I gave it to the prosecution. Like, did you have this report? Did you have this report? Did you have this report? Nope. No. Nope, they, nope, nope. they didn't have all the factors yeah. that that played into the case. Yeah, his ME said you take all this into consideration. Correct. And then when they were asked, did you look at any of this? No. So you didn't do exactly what you just said you need to do so that's a good, another great example first off exactly what we talked about in the chat we played this exact part of the cross-examination of the defense is expert where lindsey blake went through all the things she didn't have that the medical examiner had it was perfect but prior made the argument it wasn't relevant you didn't need any of that and they they make um uh they make their opinions on cause and manner of death all the time without those additional factors so theoretically they didn't need to have that but this is a great scenario of two lawyers making two completely different arguments based on the same set of facts, and they just believe the argument of the state. And a lot of that has to do with common sense and using your experience. And what do you think? More information is usually better. And like we said, the medical examiner had that information. This jury had that information. They both came to the same conclusion. The defense expert didn't have that information. So we can understand why a very smart expert, she wasn't trying to do anything wrong. She wasn't purposefully lying but she just didn't have all the information and it gave the jury a good out to disagree with her testimony. It's exactly what we said when the evidence was presented and that's how the jury bought it. What about the testimony of his children? Oh my gosh, that was awful. 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 Every, uh, that was scripted. It was exactly. scripted, it was painful. It was... And the rebuttal witnesses, the, the Halloween kid, he had no reason to lie in my opinion. And right. yeah, the refuted guard, the uh, recorded conversation from officer, was it Hope? Whichever one went to go deliver their autopsy. Oh, right. Mattingly. Do you want to, Mattingly, thank do you. you. Want to, do you want, yeah. And everything she said contradicted what was on that, that tape. So it's just, they lost all credibility in my mind based on the rebuttal witnesses. Right? Well, how important is rebuttal? How important is going first and last? Now, I still think it would have been a guilty verdict without rebuttal, but that solidified everything in this jury's mind. They believed the person that Garth worked with at Halloween, that Garth contradicted his story. And what's funny about that is some people had some issues and we po pointed out some stuff that does this really make sense based on the timeline? Are they going to attack his credibility? But he doesn't really have a reason to lie. Why would he come and do all this just to lie? That doesn't make sense either. And at the end of the day, did whatever the story was Garth told him and how he found his mom, does that really prove Chad did it? No. But what it does is it crushes the credibility of the defense witnesses. It crushes the defense arguments. It crushes the opportunity for reasonable doubt. And it solidifies that the state is credible, that what the state's saying is the consistent story, and that this is going to be a guilty verdict. Going last, having rebuttal is so important. They have the burden, but oh boy, do they have the advantage. They go first in opening, they go last in closing, they go first with their case in chief, they go last with rebuttal. The state should win every trial because they should only bring trials that they're confident they can win beyond a reasonable doubt. And when they lose, it's usually a problem. Something went wrong. Either with their work, the way they looked at the evidence, they pushed, somebody did something. They should win every case. They have all the advantages. They have all the resources. They have everything on their side. They have the choice whether or not they want to go through and push this towards trial. So they should win. We yeah. did talk amongst us that, you know, how sad for those kids to be that brainwashed that they actually and we all said the same exact thing. It's so sad. We don't hate them for it. This jury didn't hate them for it. It was really sad. But he had nothing to do with it. Or is it the fact that they're scared of him? Mm -hmm. And you heard that he talks to his daughter every day. Well, he did, right? He did. I don't know. Yeah, did. We don't know if that's going to be able to continue. But that was one yeah. of the questions that we asked it's... post on the drive back to get our stuff. But I don't know if we got an answer to it. Um, we got, he will have very limited contact with the outside world. Right. Like no, no personal no visitors. No in-person visitors. And he can have like a FaceTime call. We don't know how often, but basically it's thing they wanted out. to know that, right? They wanted to know his jail schedule and what, you know, benefits he would have in jail. Hours <clears throat> of solitary confinement. Right. Your thoughts about seeing those autopsy photos. Is that hardest day? Days? For me, Hard, I mean, but... I broke down. It was, when I left the court, I literally broke down. It was difficult. It was to me, how can somebody be that cruel to a child who they trust that person as they trust more than anybody in the whole entire world. Their protector did their that protector, to them. And, you know, 
he's awake. He's obviously scratching. They duct tape him so he can't move. He, they put a bag over his head. I mean, all, all of them were heinous, but you just think this poor little boy, Okay. Somebody doing this to him, and they're the people he trusts most in the entire world. Well, Tylee, I just, I, ever, I just yeah. can only hope that however she died, it was quick and painless because just the thought of the things that were done to her. Yes, it's just it, yeah, it's like which came first? Yeah. Oh, hopefully, yeah. the and to see that picture first. of them in Yellowstone with Alex and the two of them, that and to think that within 24 hours she's cut up, pickaxed, chopped, burnt, and buried. I, and where's just, the rest of her? Yeah, right. and yeah. Tammy was no less heinous. I mean, this is oh, yeah. this is somebody that he's married to for 30 years, raises five children with. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, to believe that he was present or he was around there and he knew that she was dying and, and a suffocation, as asphyxiation. Was it as bad as you thought it would be going into it or worse? It was worse. It was worse. It was worse. It was worse because you find out more details of how calculated and planned and uncaring and free, unemotional. Free. And yeah, all he wanted was to be able to go have sex with this 126 pound blonde goddess. I mean, that was his whole, that's what he wanted to do. So when you have, when you have that attention grabbing evidence and theme, you can see how it hits jurors. And there were two things. Now, nobody likes this. And I'm not gonna say anybody wants this or finds it entertaining or enjoyment at all. But when you have horribly gruesome details of what happened to victims, that makes a jury understand how important this is and how bad this is. And they look at that person differently that's being accused that the state and law enforcement are pointing the finger at. And they had those details as we heard them talk about the autopsies. Then number two, money, power, sex. That that's what he wanted. That's what he was after. It was so obvious when you show pictures and you show them together and you show them in Hawaii. And they talk about bikinis and bathing suits and things like that. When you have that, the jury starts looking at him and I think there's definitely some disdain in some of these jurors' faces and voices when they talk about Chad Daybell. I, don't, I think Friday though was harder for, yeah, for me with like, all the family. All, all of that was hard, and then, and you still find a way to disconnect a little bit. And then Friday, the victim statements. There was only one set of dry eyes in the room. That's true. Mm -hmm. That was Chad. Tell me about your, you're sitting across from this guy every day. I'm sure you're watching him. Each of you, I'm sure, in a moment, would just want to watch him and study him, or at least try to mm -hmm. gauge what he's thinking. Mm -hmm. Did any of you ever make eyes make eyes with him? Have a, a thought of compassion or sympathy or any anything he made eyes with me one time like we stared at each other for a little while and then he did one of these and then he just looked away yeah and wow. to me i felt like was that a oh well i know i'm i know i'm done here or or you know what was that but no expressions other than that that was it and i locked eyes with him several times i mean he was directly in front of me with you if you will and i made a pact with myself that i'm not going to be the first one to break it mm -mm. but during that whole time you were just looking at the shell he uh yeah. i never saw any emotions no. it was never. more like he was just is this over yet right. yeah, like, yeah. he tried to act like he was crying with tammy because they got the napkins out the oh, out. he tried to right. act like it but he never made it that, happen though it, no, no it wasn't was, there but the color of his face never changed never right. you're crying, you're about yeah. your, or his your eyes never glossed yeah. over <laughs> he may have been yeah. sorry but he was only sorry that he got caught right and he couldn't fulfill his little fantasy island mm -hmm. yeah. you know whatever he wanted to go right. do and write his books and have his, as you said, his blonde goddess there. I mean, literally, they were like, uh-uh, you're not going to kill all these people and get what you want, your little fantasy island. I mean, that is literally the story and the theme throughout the prosecution's case from day one, and they executed it amazingly well. What was it like amongst your group, you know, when you go in the back on the breaks and... You all seem very friendly, and Nick and I talked about a little about about that this morning. You all seem to get along. No one, no one was yeah. a too it, No, it's, yeah. it's funny because usually in groups, and we've all been in groups with work and with college and with whatever, mm -hmm. and there always seems to be you know you get so many together, you're going to have a certain percentage that are outliers for whatever reason. And we really hard to did, get along yeah, hard to get along with, or yeah. opinionated, or annoying, or and there wasn't. We actually got along really well, and we wished, I think I did anyway, that we could have talked about it. Of course, as it went along, like you could go in and go, "Can you believe they just yeah, said that?" Exactly. Oh my gosh! And uh, you did you hear that? So I think we compensated because you get to know everybody and kind of their lives. And we joked and we joked with the marshals and about the marshals, and they joked with us. And so I think it was a good. They had a good camaraderie. It was. Yeah, it was, it was probably the best. I mean, if I ever had to go through it, mm -hmm. these seventeen other people would be the ones I would want to go through it again with. Mm -hmm. It was so refreshing to be able to laugh as hard as we did uh -huh. with yeah. each other. <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, yeah. sometimes it made me feel a little guilty, like we're having all this fun and we just came in from a murder trial. But at the same time, what else are we supposed to do? Yeah. I mean, are we not supposed to do trial, that? Yeah. Absolutely. We did. Yeah. We did. Yeah. Yeah. It was good therapy for yeah. for yeah. the, the yeah. eighteen yeah. of us to. Yep. How about out the outside world? You guys would go home. 
Did any of you try to work? Oh, I yes. had to. I yeah. Mean, yeah. I, I mean, and you were able to focus on. I mean, it's kind of shut it off and focus. Kind there, of. It was there kind were of like days that. that you know I, I went in and it's just like I can't be here and you know, very supportive boss, very supportive company. But yeah, and there was days that I texted him. It's just like it's not happening today. But for the most part, there were several of us that you know kept our day jobs, if you will, uh, nights and weekends. And some were fortunate and didn't have to go in. But for the most part, we we you know all of us kept doing our jobs as we were going through this. Mm -hmm. I thought that I'd be able to leave there at 3.30 and go to my job at in the office for two or three hours. You know, come on, stop that. Yeah. After the first day, I couldn't do it. It's like, I do it. I would wait and go in and it's sleep like when on you got later. home at four o'clock, five o'clock, whatever, you were so mentally exhausted. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't oh, want yeah. to cook. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't mm -hmm. want to cook. I yeah, I mean, and and again, this is a lawyer show, so I'm not, I'm not saying boo-hoo for lawyers, but guess what lawyers have to do after doing this? Being in this trial, presenting this, I mean, this is how exhausting it is to just sit there and listen to it. And I agree with them. And I, it's true. They're not puffing it up. It is exhausting to go through this. So imagine what it's like for the lawyers to present all this. Then guess what they do when they go back? They continue to work on this trial. They continue to work on other cases that they have. Trial work is a grueling and stressful process and a draining process for lawyers, which is why I say, even when lawyers struggle sometimes, if they stutter through stuff, you know, some lawyers in the Karen Reed case that people don't like, or they think are, you know, baffling, bumbling, whatever it may be, or have a misstep here and there. It's really hard and exhausting for everybody involved. It canceled many, many plans because I didn't want to go out and have to have conversations. And most of the time it was just go to bed early and go sleep. It's like jet it. lag times 10. You know, if you sleep too much, it makes you tired. It, it was insane. We could work all week and not be as tired as it was one day. Oh, yeah. One day is equivalent to a week of exhaustion. Right. Right. Yeah, I was like, is this going to change? Are we going to feel, you know, this is not going to change. This is not the normal me. And I had, you know, my son and my mother saying, it's just for a short time. So I, your loved ones knew the trial, I'm sure. Oh, oh yeah. No, a couple, a couple of them. And were, they, were any of them following it? Hmm. A couple times you watch the live feed, but yeah. it, then it became because half the time, you know, they don't show it when it's on. So you'd actually truly have to dedicate your entire day, you, you know, to, to yeah. see everything that was happening. So I think my mother watched it a little bit. Because she knew when we get out of court, was, oh, you're going home early today. And I was like, wow, I have spies. But, <laughs> but she, I don't think she followed it like every well, single day. Let's fast forward to the to the phase of deliberations for this. And again, just because their family members followed it, as we've seen in other cases, or maybe some people they knew, doesn't mean they spoke to them. The verdict. Was that tough to reach the guilty? It really wasn't. It, it was, was it was, it was really drawn out step by step by step. Do you believe this? Yes. Then you, do you believe this? Is this true? And if there was a question, we would go back and pull some evidence to make sure we were right, that that was the, that was the date. That was what happened. So the guilty verdict was not difficult. She said, and usually because of that, that builds pretty good camaraderie with the jury as a whole. So it's not surprising at how well they kind of all mesh and agree with things because they were all on the same page. Now, if you have some disagreement, that's when things can get interesting and it might not be quite as kumbaya, but when you have a straight to the point and a straightforward case like this one, as hard as it is, as grueling as it is, it can be like not gratifying, but it can be, you know, it can, it can give you a little sense of purpose when you get to the right verdict and everybody in the room agrees. And then you find out the judge agrees and the community agrees and the public agrees. And it makes you feel a lot better that you quote unquote got it right. But really we didn't, there wasn't another choice. If you answered all of those things correctly, based on the evidence that it was guilty. I was very broke down the instructions. It was broke down. It was step by step. And I was impressed that, you know, we would go, you know, what about this witness? First question asked, what day? And we'd all mm -hmm. start flipping through our notebooks and then mm -hmm. we'd compare notes and go, okay, that was so right. They, and then we'd move, move on to the next question. So pull up the insurance yeah. paper that we signed. Yep, that that yep. There it is. Yep. We got it. You know, yeah, our memory is correct. And then we move on to the next question. We definitely all had questions, but I think a lot of us had the same questions. So some jurisdictions, you can't bring your notes back. They could bring their notes back here. I always think it's helpful Problem is sometimes their notes can be wrong. And then when they bring them back there, their notes kind of become evidence. So we want them to rely on their memory. It's all this stuff that lawyers write when we write these, these rules of, you know, trials and how trials are going to work. It's like the path of least resistance kind of, it's like, well, their notes could be wrong. It's like their memory could be wrong too. It's like, but if their memory's wrong, we're just like picking a person. So we'd rather them just rely on their memory and their collective memory is a better chance. And if they have a note, they're more likely to believe a wrong note than a wrong memory. If they have different memories, these are the types of conversations we have. And we try to figure out what's the least bad way to do this because how the heck can you remember months and months and weeks and weeks of trial? It's impossible. So notes obviously help, but if they wrote down the wrong date or the wrong time, is that going to throw off the whole trial? These are the stuff we go round and round about in our uh, rules committee meetings but they will easily, they were easily answered when we went back and looked through our notes and, and everybody agreed there. We didn't have any holdouts. 
let's put it that, that way. We didn't have any holdouts that said, no, I don't agree that he's, I, I, I don't think he's guilty. That it was just making sure that all the evidence that we had supported, what it, said. supported it. What was life like as a juror? The food, the bathroom situation. Okay, <laughs> the bathroom was a joke. For all me. right, so we're going to just let this roll for a few minutes. I'm going to try not to interrupt it very much because this is cool stuff. That is different for every jury. Ha has with the camaraderie, the bailiffs, the courthouse, the jurisdiction is very different, but it is cool to see what it's like. And I think the way they explain it is an encouragement for other people that may be scared of jury duty or apprehensive or don't want to do it or don't want to show up, things like that. It, it can be, there can be some enjoyable parts of it and it can feel really good to do your civic duty in a society that you take part in, you pay taxes and you live in and could affect you or a loved one one day me because for some reason I was paranoid. You better go to the bathroom before, you, you know, when you're on break because you don't know what's going to happen, right? I can go at work six hours without going to the bathroom, right? Oh no, not apparently here. Every two hours. <laughs> and, and you had to ask. And we had, we had one marshal that we jokingly called him Chihuahua because he was very nice at the same time. <laughs> he knows it. We called him. And you would ask him, you know, can we go to the bathroom now? Can we go to the bathroom? Just wait. And then he'd make fun of us that we were the worst jury ever as far as we could go to the bathroom. It, it was clear. He was, he was just making Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. So I went back to work yeah. one Friday when we had it off and um, they're like, what are you, what are you so excited about today? Because you're going to sit in your office. It looks like I can pee whenever I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How about the food and the snacks? I mean, were you, they were really, I mean, they were we really good about well trying. We were well, we were well taken care of. We were treated with respect. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. The four and bailiff guys were phenomenal. They, they were. were great. Call them yeah. handlers. You know, they right. drove us there every morning. We're in a van with them every night. We're in a van with them. And they meet off site and there's two vans, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. I don't think, well, I know for me in the beginning, I felt like it was a little overboard to have all this protection and come on, we're adults. I got this, you know, I, I, we don't really need all this protection, but at the very end, um, it was needed, but we didn't know it was needed, but not for the same reasons. There, it was like a security blanket. We never had to question whether somebody would get to us or that it was <coughs> never a thought. So it was like an emotional piece we didn't have to go through. They really... They made sure at every turn, our security, our well-being was first. So the marshals and the sheriff's deputies were amazing. And then you get sequestered. And what was that like? <laughs> it's it just surreal. When you they were sequestered for the verdict, which is always interesting and probably a little bit scary for them, I would guess. But it seems like they made it as good as possible um, for these jurors in the courtroom and the courthouse, which I think is important. No phone, no TV, no music. Nothing. No radio. Basically sit in your room in silence. And the first night we had to be in our rooms, they wouldn't let us out in the hallway. So you just went to your room. And I, I, I mean, that seems crazy, right? And now you know why most judges are very apprehensive to sequester jurors. No TV, no cell phones, basically no nothing. You can read a book. That's about it. And as grueling and a horrible, and these jurors saying how hard it was and, you know, going back to work and trying to focus on other things and just going to sleep some nights because they were so exhausted. Imagine if you knew what was waiting for you. Just silence and sitting there alone with your thoughts, how much harder that makes it. And that can affect the juror's psyche. So even lawyers have to be careful about when to request sequestration of a jury throughout an entire trial and why it is so rare. And that's all. Put away your clothes. I didn't move in. I didn't figure the TV out yet. The volume, you turn it up on the remote 15. And you, you got a remote? And you can't hardly <laughs> hear it. So did they remove the TVs? They removed yeah, the, the remote so you couldn't have internet. So we had and a the DVD course. player. Yeah, and the course. So we only watched DVDs. You, so you, couldn't, you couldn't turn the volume up and down. You could only watch DVDs that they gave you. That's really interesting, right? It's so cool to get this background and learn this information. It's so cool. Because again, even as a lawyer, like all I get from jurors is what jurors will talk to me, which usually are only jurors that like us or thought, you know, we did a good job or whatever. Even when we win cases, a lot of jurors just don't want to talk or are nervous or whatever, busy. I get it. So to get like this much interaction with jurors is really interesting. And it does solidify a lot of the stuff that we find out and research and learn and, and gather, but also what companies get research wise and jurors. Most of the stuff that I've listened to and watched in these high profile cases that we cover on YouTube is right in line with all the research that we've studied and gotten from companies. And with manually or change the channels crazy. or anything. Yeah. And the DVDs had to be approved. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And books. And games. And we couldn't and you can't call anybody. No. Oh, no. Oh, no. no. No phones, we no got a TV, no call radio. Every day that had to be on speakerphone and the bailiff had to be there to listen to the Had phone. to be there listening. Yeah. Or the thing I was. And, and that sounds like crazy. That sounds like a militaristic society, but I love it. That's protection. I think these jurors understood how important this was and didn't have a problem with it. And it was explained to them and they understood it. And look, they turned out fine. And this is probably why the verdict came quicker than we thought, right? They didn't want to extend this any more than they had to. 
And I do think sequestering for a verdict in a case like this might be a good idea because they are just going to want to work, work on um, deliberating and going through evidence and coming to their decision morning, noon, and night if they have nothing else to do. Prepared for is again, the six marshals had been sworn in three days, three nights, if you will. We had additional security there that couldn't talk to us. And every time I opened my door, one of the chairs was right there, just, I mean, happenstance. They couldn't say hi to me. They couldn't say good morning. And it was just weird to get out of habit. Good morning. Yeah. And they just look at you and we're like, okay. we're, we're not going to be accused. They followed their rules. They, 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 followed they just their looked their at you stone faced. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, hey, I get the game, but they I was not prepared job. for that. They did their job. Wow. I don't remember the last time we've had a sequestered jury. That was a long time. That's what we were told. Yeah. That's what we were told. Wow. And this was the longest case. The judge said this was the longest case in Idaho history. Sequestration happens. You go back, you say guilty. Then you have to go back and deliberate penalty. What was that like? That was a lot harder. It was a lot harder. It was, harder. It, it was longer, but there was so much more at stake. I mean, this was a big, this was a huge a once life. in a life yeah. decision. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make sure that we got it right. And it took a lot more steps to make sure what, how we understood it and what we were doing was correct. So but the law was laid out for us very, very clearly. Here are the aggravating circumstances. Here they are, A, B, C, D, E. Do you agree that this was an aggravating circumstance? Do you agree that it was a night? If you do, you move that forward to phase two. And when we had conversations, some deep conversation about several of those, but for the most part, I mean, in the end, we all agreed. It was, it was every mitigating, circ every aggravating circumstance was moved forward. And there was no mitigating circumstances no. that Pryor had brought up or Chad himself that would given us a reason to say, even though there was this aggravated mitigating circumstance, it's okay because there's all this good stuff, you know, that yeah. he did or there was reasons and no one gave us that. Well, so even, therefore, yeah, Nick even brought up that uh -huh. he's like, you wanted to talk about uh -huh. the mitigating uh -huh. um, circumstances and mm -hmm. he was adamant about it. And the one thing that we all agreed on the mitigating circumstance was he did have 50 years of an exemplary life. Mm -hmm. He had no speeding tickets. He had no history of any, mm -hmm. any legal problems whatsoever. Okay. But somewhere in there, he changed. Somewhere something went yeah. good. Or I think it was all. I believe it was all there after you know them showing the stuff he's been writing and reading and, right. and talking about for a long time. I think he just finally had a catalyst for it to all just it all came come out. out. And that was Lori. Well, it was Lori, but it was also the group and the people listening to him and people believing him and Alex following. Like finally, he's been trying this his whole life, but finally he had people listening and enough people listening and the right people listening. Alex Cox, I think, is the most important person listening, right? Because Lori wasn't going to actually do these deeds. They needed Alex Cox, and I guess Lori was the connection there, but very interesting to think they thought Maybe this was how he always was. And it didn't just, obviously the, the defense's theory was it all changed when Lori entered the picture. Doesn't feel like the jury feels that way. In him and it mm -hmm. just all. He really believed the yeah. stuff he was writing, I think. I mean, to move his family to Rexburg. To move his family to Rexburg. This is the guy at the, the end of the table, leaning on the table. Um, I, I really like his disposition. It's like, it's really sad. He believed it. He brainwashed these kids. This is what pure evil looks like, is people that do this. Earthquakes were going to happen in Salt Lake that he was going to lead, build those, uh, you know, new cities there is just unbelievable to me. And, and did he really believe that? Because in the end, their plan was to move to Hawaii. So he even moved away from the city where he was yep. going to lead the 144,000. Yep. He moved to Hawaii and all that became. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No True. Do they believe that or did, did they just want Fantasy Island, like she said before? And again, contradictions, losing credibility. When it looks like you want the motive the state points out more than what your books are writing about, that's where you lose. Boy, after he got no his money. Way. His now, I got, now I have what I want and yep. I'm on my way. What was it like walking in the courtroom the last time when they, the clerk reads the penalty that you 12 knew and no one else did? You didn't want to really make eye contact with any of It was heart. It was, to me, it was heart wrenching. And I, I couldn't, I couldn't not cry. I'm like, I watched him again through that whole thing and no emotion. No emotion. No you know, emotion. I, and I went a slightly different way in my mind. There was closure to me because, again, I already knew the answer. There was some emotion, you know, I made a mistake and locked eyes with grandpa. And well, that was a, yeah, I think, okay, I got to hold this back. But there was the. And people wonder why family sitting there is so important and supporting the victims or even supporting the defendant or supporting witnesses. When family come and they sit back there, or they testify, and then after they testify, they sit in court every single day. We see it in uh, the Karen Reed trial. If the jury's with the prosecution, they, and they they feel like that is the person that did this to the victim, they start feeling for that victim. They start seeing there. They start looking for them. They start locking eyes with them. They start having emotional attachments and reactions based on how those victim family members are acting. And that's what he's saying here. When he locked eyes with family members, 
he was like, oh, I got to hold this back. And I made the right decision for these family members. Very interesting. It was kind of surreal because it's like, this is over. I've made the decision. I'm 100% at peace with it. Now it's just, we're, we're done. So it, it, I wouldn't say it was an emotional thing for me. It was just kind of that, the deep breath, if you will. Yeah. And then let down, just knock you out. Yeah. And then you actually get home and the dam can break and all of the oh, things yeah. that have built up over the last two months. That you, you didn't even know was there. That I didn't know was yeah. there. And, you know, I can talk to somebody other than it's my like dog. I've told people about like every day or after a verdict and a trial, the adrenaline drop unlike anything I've ever felt in my life, literally. Oh, then everything came out. <laughs> I got home and I goes, I'll have dinner ready in about a half hour or so. And I said, okay, let me sit for a minute. And 10.30, she wakes me up and says, you probably better go to bed. <laughs> Where, where's dinner? Yeah. Go to bed. <laughs> yeah. 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 Bam, wow. Right? You know, one of the sad things, though, that came into my mind is we've lost four people already, even though Charles didn't come into this. He was part of it. We've lost four lives. This doesn't end here. There's going to be another life lost. We sent somebody to the death. Parents can't complain about them thinking Charles is involved in this in any way, even though his death, Daybell wasn't charged, because that's they talked about that more than the prosecution did, I felt like. The death has not ended in this case. For this family, it's not over. For those kids, it's not over. Well, it may be over for us, mm -hmm. but it's not totally over for them. And I think it's awful that whatever Chad has put in his children's minds, that they will not even go to their grandmother's funeral They're and not talk to them their mom after after being raised with these people is just unbelievable to me. That's that's just a whole nother awful um, result of what Chad... So instead of Chad's kids coming and supporting him looking good for the defense, it actually just made it look worse. It confirmed to this jury that he's manipulative, that he makes people do what's best for him, who cares about if it's good or bad for them, who cares if it's good or bad for the rest of the family, who cares what trauma anybody else is having. If it's good for Chad, he's going to force people to do it. That's how they looked at the sick kids supporting Chad could go either way, right? They could be like, oh, wow, his kids are supporting him. Obviously, something's weird there because if they really felt like he did this to the mom, there's no way they support him. They didn't think that because the state built up the manipulation, the self-proclaimed prophet and visionary of Chad Daybell and how it affected all of these people, Zulema, Melanie Gibb, Melanie Boudreau, Lori, Alex, and the kids. Do you want to talk to Chad? I he asked, it. do you want to talk to Chad? Sorry, I was talking over him. He said, do you want to talk to Chad? And here's their response. And I thought it might be interesting just to see if there mm -hmm. could be or would be an emotion outside of the big spectacle, right? We got a big spectacle here and right. he's the main focus, right? Mm -hmm. Would there really be any remorse, right. any emotions? You know, I, I have a hard time believing that there would be. But he's be not going to give us what we need. No, oh, absolutely not. I was no. disappointed he's... he didn't talk. I, me too. Um, they, that, that confirms that even if he would have talked, even if he would have testified, they don't think it would have given them what they needed. I agree with them, which again confirms it was probably the right decision not to testify. As bad as it sounds, and we know he lost, and he lost big in the best way or the biggest way he could lose, they all pretty much know if he would have testified, it wouldn't have fixed anything. So from the defense's perspective, if they thought it was too big of a risk, there really wasn't going to be that much of a reward. But no, I would not want to sit down and talk to them because, you know, to her point, I don't think you would get, you wouldn't get the closure that you wanted. You would get, you know, preached to, if you will. And I, I have no desire for that, but I really wish he would have talked on his own just so I could yeah. hear what he had to At say and what end, he thought. Have something. Yeah, something. Yeah, what are his, yeah, what what are his thoughts about Even if he justified this? it. I mean, you know what I mean? Even if he had reasons, but something. Mm -hmm. but Do you think if he had, if he had come on and apologized and said, I was caught up in this affair and showed some something that maybe he would have gotten life in prison maybe no. that with not just that alone no if, right. if if prior had actually shown some sort of evidence What's interesting like, is they really wanted him to talk why for whose benefit for theirs they wanted him to talk they wanted to hear from him for their benefit or maybe for the victim's benefit do you know who it wouldn't have benefited because they're saying it wouldn't have benefited chad daybell and so just another example of chad daybell is only going to do something if it benefits chad daybell Frankly, from a criminal defendant's perspective, you really should only testify it's going to benefit you. If you're going to take a plea deal, then sure, apologize and show remorse and everything to the victims. But if we're talking about a trial and there's no benefit to you to testify, probably making the right decision, not testifying. But again, the jury's looking at it. They wanted it for their benefit, for closure for them, for the victims. And it just confirms what they already think about Chad Daybell. He doesn't care about any of those people. He said there were 300,000 other texts, you know. Well, show us one that supports your side of it. So know? I felt like that was interesting. She said Pryor said there were 3,000 other texts. Why don't you show one? So you're not allowed to show irrelevant stuff, right? 
So how many texts could he really have shown to say they talked about other stuff if that's not relevant? Now, maybe he could have argued it was relevant to show they had normal conversations and some of it would have come in, but no way a judge would have let them read through all these text messages just to show that the percentage of text they showed was such a small one. So I'm not really sure, sure what he could have done with the text, right? You guys might let me know in the comments. If there had been something like that, in addition to Chad saying this, and it, it, there could have been mitigating circumstances then that wouldn't justify it. It said that definitely wasn't justified, but... And there was nothing that nothing. came up uh, out of either of them or out of him that said, you know, I'm no longer going to do the, the church of the firstborn. Mm -hmm. You know, all this, I've, I've actually found the way, the light, the true God, the true Christianity, you know, I'm at begging for forgiveness. I'm going to change my life around. You know, that would have given me a little, a little other feelings of, but there was nothing. That no and remorse. That, that to me is a thought going forward, like for hope that people do change their ways and beg for forgiveness and realize what they did was manipulative and wrong. Will that happen? I don't know. But she was kind of thinking a lot of what we've talked about in the chat and what my feelings are on people going to prison or even people that are convicted or even waiting on the death penalty. We hope he finds the truth. We hope he finds the light. We hope he finds the way and turns from his purely evil, manipulated, manipulative ways and uses of religion like the guy at the end of the table said. So I thought that was kind of interesting as well. There was no remorse. I'm annoyed that this isn't over yet. Right. And, you know, whether he still believes By it or way, not. By the way, it's pretty clear they didn't care if he wanted the death penalty because they felt it was the right move and that's what they were um, going to vote on. They didn't really care like, oh, let's give him life because he wanted death or let's give him what he doesn't want. They were just like, no mitigation. We've got to look at the evidence. The evidence points to death. The state's asking for death. If Chad wants it, great. I don't care. That's not coming into our decision. And I think that's the right way to look at it. Uh, that, was one of our, that was one of yeah. our questions. Is he a danger going forward? We all believe and said yes. There are other children there are other, that he was raiding. Yes. Melanie's, and, Melanie's, yeah, Melanie's. Yeah, another piece of evidence the defense thought was good for them, and I actually thought was a pretty good argument, that other people were raided as dark and they didn't get hurt during the guilt phase was a horrible piece of evidence for the penalty phase. Because if he's still raiding other people's de uh, uh, death percentages in dark and they're still alive, he's a danger to those people. Because look what happened to some other people he raided that way. Oof, great point by them. He sure, going to go right back out there and start this whole thing up all over well, again? eventually the money would have run out. And exactly. And then he would have had a life insurance policy. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. But he would have found his next Alex, I believe. Mm -hmm. so and his next Lori. Somebody who he could manipulate to be his, you know, his muscle, if you will, his warrior. He would have found him at some point, or her, mm -hmm. and this would have continued. Mm -hmm. Because right. he thought. liked feeling like he was God. Yeah. He, he was in charge. control. He mm -hmm. had all the answers. Mm -hmm. Everybody came to him. Well, that was right. Life in prison solves that problem as well. But I still get what they're saying. I get what they're saying. Absolutely. And this was one of the questions on the penalty phase. Part of the plan was that Melanie Boudreau and getting Brandon's life insurance and then her children's social security payments. And then that didn't work. So, yeah, there would have been another there would have been another family. Been, it's just it next time you better make sure the person that is the protector gladiator knows how to shoot a gun better, yeah. has better aim. And you don't bury the children on your property. In I mean, shallow graves in he had, to, shot. Yeah. <laughs> he had to be in agreement with, with all of that, you know, especially burying him on his property. What in the world? Anything that you guys want to add? The judge and the prosecutors were great. The, all, of the, all of the marshals and the staff were amazing. Everybody they did, was amazing. They did a really good job. Mm -hmm. I hope that it brings some, some form of peace to all the victims in the case. Yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. You can't ever bring them back, but at least no. you can have some, they can have some, some closure, some closure yeah. and to know that justice justice was served as far as it could be. Right. Thank you, sir. Justice was served as far as it could be. I really enjoyed that personally. And I really respect these jurors. I appreciate Nate Eaton and East Idaho news, um, getting these interviews and putting them out there. I find it really interesting. And you guys all sent it to me and had so many questions. So I'm glad we were able to get to it. Uh, the younger juror who didn't really speak a ton in this interview with the glasses, he's the one that I think there's an individual interview on him for about 30 minutes. If you guys want me to break it down, if you want me to recap it, let me know in the comments. And if enough of you do, then I will hit the like button on this video. That'll also let me know that you want future juror breakdowns of this video um, and continuing on this case, uh, because I want to do the content and look at the content, and react to stuff that you guys are most interested in. So keep me posted. That's the way you can let me know. Um, I appreciate you guys so much. I can't wait to read the comments on here and what you guys thought and felt and learned from these jurors. Um, that's all we got for this video. Until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out The Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter.
If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the lawyer you know.